I did it again, ladies and gentlemen. I did it again. Rabbi Tobias Singer, Dr. Robert M. Price come together again, talking about anti-Semitism in the New Testament Gospels, maybe even going into Paul. Let me know what you guys think of the show. Hit that like button. Don't forget to hit the bell and subscribe to the channel and join us on the Patreon. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. As you can see, we have two amazing people joining today uh, on the Myth Vision Podcast. We're going to go into the Gospels, but I first want to introduce you guys. If you don't know it by now, the King of the Jews is here, and it is Rabbi Tobia Singer. Welcome to the show, Rabbi. It's always great to be here. Yes, sir. And then we also have Brian um, from the life of Brian. Um, who is blessed because he is a cheesemaker. That's and, um, right. I'm just teasing. We Cheese eater. <laughs> cheese eater. Uh, Robert M. Price, double PhD, of course, scholar on New Testament studies. And we're going to be dealing with the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who are watching, stay tuned. It's going to be exciting. And Rabbi, if you don't mind, we're going to take a, a tour in your bus, delving into the gospel scenario where you and Dr. Price can have an open conversation discussing what's going on in the New Testament uh, I honestly did not have any specifics in mind because there's so much you can cover in the Gospels, uh, and I know it'll be a fascinating conversation. So thank you for joining me, and thank you, Dr. Price, for making it mm. over here. Uh, I really appreciate both of you gentlemen. Yeah, so great to be on. So this is the whole question you have, and that's the whole thing, and you're trying to make a living doing it like this? <laughs> okay. Usually a little input, a little preparation, put in two, three minutes, something— Nothing, go. Because <laughs> so, <laughs> he, he had, he had a few, you know, witnesses on, a few cult members on. So now he's a big kacha. He doesn't even need a question anymore. Let's go. Go ahead. Okay. So, <laughs> no so is Jesus, let, let, let's go this. Let's do this. Go ahead. I think it's important. We got a rabbi on, on the show. Okay. Yeah. It's important that I think we point out non Jewish tendencies. In the Gospels, I think it's important that we discuss things that seem very contrary to someone who's going to be in the venue of Judaism mm -hmm. in the New Testament, as well as potential anti-Semitic tendencies that play roles within the, the Gospels. We know John does it, and you guys mentioned this last time, as well as Matthew. Mm -hmm. Do I earn my pay now, Rabbi? Yes, you do. So that <laughs> this is a very interesting point. Now, finally, he's making a living. So this is this is really an excellent point because if you have a book like Huckleberry Finn that's not trying to be Jewish, so then it's not a problem, just a piece of American literature. The problem, the staggering problem with Matthew that at least comes through to me as a Jew is that you have somebody attempting to be Jewish or someone who's who's tempting to present this religion as something that is the the result of the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures, that's what unmasks it. And this is not unique to Matthew alone, although Matthew is most notable for the fulfillment citations, but the Gospels all seek to present, all the New Testament writers seek to present this belief as the, the result of the of the Torah and of the prophets and writings. Luke says in 2444, Matthew's fulfillment citations that are very striking, meaning saying that th this happened in the career of Jesus, either his virgin conception or his birth in Bethlehem, and so on and so forth, that is something that's very, very striking. And to the, I could just speak for myself. When I read the Christian Bible for the first time, must have been 16, turning 17, I was shocked. This is just a personal thing, because I didn't come at this for academic reasons. There were people who were trying to convert Jews, my people, to Christianity. And when I read Matthew, I was stunned by two things that just exploded in my face. The first thing was the anti-Jewish nature of it. I mean, the the Jews are, sen are the villain in all the Gospels. I mean, one of the things about the Gospels are, are the, is that 
the um, the characters are very well developed. Who is the hero? Who is the villain? That's very clear to anyone. They're all very well developed. So that the Jews, Jews do not, <laughs> no one's going to read the New Testament or read the Gospels and go, oh, the Jews are fantastic. What a terrific people this <laughs> is. I wish I could be around more Jews. This is the best thing that ever happened. The Jews are in every turn the villains. So this is something very shocking. It's like reading the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. You just read it and it's just, it's, it's, it's horrific because the Jew, he, the Gospels are all stories. You know, unlike the letters of Paul, the Gospels are basically just stories, vignette, one after the other, the other. John is a little u unique because you have these very long dialogues, but that's really more Joannium. And you read it, and the Jews are ever present in every story, and the Jews are just the worst people in the world. I mean, Jesus is just going around. He's trying to heal a paralytic. He's healing a blind guy, and, and the Jews are screaming at Sabbath. And the Jews are just trying to do everything possible to prevent the Son of God from doing his work. They're just so that comes through, and it's the storytelling that makes it so toxic. It, it's not, you know, it's not the statement that you have in First Thessalonians two fourteen through sixteen. Even as they have the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus Christ and their own prophets, and kind of, this kind of I don't even know if that's original to First Thessalonians. But let's just so that's just saying the Jews are these bad people. But when you tell a story, and the Jew is the villain. And it's you just can't understand why the Jews trying to interfere with God's work. So of course, Luther was completely rational when he read these texts, and the ideas that are emerged from it just suffused his mind. Of course, he was an anti-Semite, as when all the reformers were. Bucer hated Jews. Calvin detested Jews. They all did. It was funny that the Jews thought that with the emergence of the Reformation, it would save them from the Catholic Church. And you know, when you had these characters emerge who were really more sola scriptor than certainly in the Catholic Church, so they really were— the, it was the only time in history that the Jews actually had to go to the Catholic Church to ask them for protection from the, from the Protestants. So that's the first thing— that comes across. It's very, very shocking. It hurts, but it also helps me understand how did Christians, rational people, who otherwise would have been moral people, had committed such crimes against my nation. And then there's the tampering with the text. So, right, so because Matthew portrays itself as kind of a Jewish book, opening with, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, Abraham, how nice. You look at the incipit of Mark, nice. And then it just explodes with us. So this is something that, of course, hit me very, very hard. Hmm. One of the worst things is at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, where uh, the tomb is discovered empty and uh, and if the whole thing is implausible, the, the guards offering the information that they fell asleep on duty, which they, they didn't, but the, they're willing, to, I mean, it's a capital crime, they're willing to, to accept it anyway. Uh, but the fact that the, the Jewish elders seem to realize Jesus rose from the dead, well, we got to hush this up. Uh, they, they know they're wrong and they want to keep up the illusion anyway. The, I mean, most of it, uh, they're, they're pictured as sort of maybe fanatical, but at least zealous champions for a very strict understanding of the law, which may itself be uh, a, a caricature, I realize. But here, oh my gosh, there's no word you can use but villains. Uh, and that really is stomach turning. Right. This is the point you've made is what most people don't get. When, when the church referred to the Jews as the devil, most people don't understand the power of that invective, what that means. So Satan in Christian theology, if you ask the Christian, does Satan know the truth? 
So the answer would be yes. Satan really is a fallen angel who really knows that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he went into rebellion against God um, because of his own haughtiness and his own boastfulness and is his chief enemy. But Satan really knows the truth. Satan is not just some... Now, this is very different than Judaism, where, where Satan is simply doing the work of God in order to provide free will. Provide is There's a temptation where he... He, he casts forth his blandishments, and hopefully that men will re resist the temptation. Satan and Christianity, this is a real dualistic idea, is an independent agent that is at war with God and naturally Jesus, and that's what the Jews is. Jews are. And that's why I always say that Matthew, if you look at it carefully, in my view, it's the most anti-Jewish book, strangely. And that story that you're describing in the Passion narrative because here you have the case where the Jews know that we are told that the Jew, Jews know, the elders know that Jesus rose from the dead. And they're willing to still bribe mm -hmm. Roman soldiers. Why are you bribing them? The Jews should have gone, oh, he really rose from the dead. We thought he didn't rise. Now that we know, we'll become Christians. No, 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 they didn't care. They'll pay them off. That means that the Jews have to be the devil, the seed of the devil. That's where that all comes from. And this all comes right from the beginning, right to the end. The Jews deep down know the truth and reject him anyway. And this, I would say, is was essential to the church. In the, I don't think I ever said this publicly. The, the reason they have to be portrayed in such a demonic, villainous fashion is because the church has a problem with the Jews. In that, there is a an unasked question that pastors, many of them dear friends of mine, tell me that their, their parishioners ask the question, but why then don't the Jews believe in Christ? Every Christian leader, perfect New Testament, all tell me this is a common question of why don't the Jews believe in Jesus? Now, this is a very big question because it's it's not like asking why the Eskimos don't believe in Jesus. <laughs> the Jews not believing in Jesus is an enormous theological conundrum. It's a it's a monumental, almost existential question for the church. Why? Because the Jews are the only people on earth that can read their Bible in its original language. The Jews are the only people that were expecting a Messiah, a Christ. This idea of a Messiah didn't mean anything to the Greeks or the Romans before. It meant nothing. The Jews were anticipating. It was their Bible that told them, that assured them that one day the Messianic Age was coming. The Jewish people always had a reputation of being a, a, a clever nation, a smart people, always had that reputation. So we have a people who it's their Bible, they're the only people who can read this book in its original language. And we talked about the, almost no church father could read the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew, with the exception of two. And they're the ones who are waiting for And why don't the Jews believe? And you can either do two things. You can either say that the Jews read the Christian Bible or read their own Bible and draw a different conclusion, which they will never say, never say, because then everyone says, well, why do they draw a different conclusion? Or you can say that they're demonic, they're the Antichrist, they're the enemies of God, and they are, in the language of, of Paul and Romans, you know, they are blinded, and it's you know, what is truth is foolishness to those. That's what Paul's always doing. He's pushing it back, explaining, why don't the Jews believe? Well, the answer is they are Satan, and therefore they are the implacable enemies of Christ. And that's where that all comes from, and exactly that text. Um, <clears throat> real quick, uh, Rabbi, I was w listening to a lecture a while back. By the way, the show's over, guys, in case you were wondering. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. I was listening to a lecture from a scholar who actually was suggesting that there are anachronistic uh, tendencies in Matthew that do look like second uh, century uh -huh. yeah. church replacement ideas. And what you're suggesting, if their theory is right, and it wasn't just that a few spots, the guy in the audience that had criticisms of the theory at the end said, look, yeah, you gave us you know a few examples and blah, 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 but that doesn't prove that uh, church replacement theologies in Matthew. 
And um, he said, that's one thing you say, but when you have consecutive arguments, and I can give you 12, 14 examples where the, the holy nation of Israel is replaced by a new nation, by a new people, by a new creation of someone else, something else, uh, then you got a problem, and it shows anachronism. So if Matthew is doing church replacement ideas, then this seems in effect. I don't – let me just put it this way. Even if Matthew's not intentionally – and I'm going to try and dole the fangs of anti-Semitism here the best I can. Let's say it's not I hate the Jews, but they're, they're being idiots for this or that. And so it comes across anti-Semitic by anyone who's reading it. Say the initial audience was Hellenistic Jews or the author was Hellenistic Jew or something like that. In effect, they created something that was anti-Semitic. That's the problem that we have. If I wrote something not meaning the intention to go full-length anti-Semitism, um, but it appears bad towards a certain people group, and it gets carried away, and next thing, well, that's my Lord, that can easily continue to make something anti-Semitic to the core. What you're suggesting, though, is that it is like anti-Semitism. Now, I'm asking to say, is it possible that these were Hellenistic Jews who were not in the vein of, of uh, you know, I guess the Hebrew strict Torah keeping Judaism, and they're more on the outskirts fringe uh, that are competing sex with this Pharisaic Judaism and others, and they're like trying to, I guess, make them look bad post destruction of the temple, saying you guys missed it, and that's what's created the anti anti Semitic uh, voice, if you will. I'm trying to play devil's advocate a little bit. What are your thoughts? You, you can't say that whoever wrote the book of Matthew was definitely not Jewish. I mean, there were Jews. You take a man like Otto Winninger, okay? He was an Austrian philosopher who was responsible for shaping Nazi thinking on race. He was a virulent anti-Semite. He was an Austrian, and I got news for you. He was a Jew who's an Austrian Jew. Whoa. Who was... And he shaped Aryan thinking and its development. Now he was he was is the classic self-hating Jew. So there are such we have such characters in history, and he he hated the Jew in him. And in fact, he sought everything he could do to to rip the Jew out of him. And but he did the first thing that people like that do is he he converted to Christianity. And then that didn't work. Then he took a gun and blew his brains out and committed suicide because that was the only way to destroy the Jew in him. So there are such individual characters in history. You have Bobby Fischer, the famed chess player. He was a, he was a Jew. He was a virulent, crazy anti-Semite. You have these people in history. Gearing's right-hand man was a Michelin. He was a Jewish descent. You have, you have these characters. No one could say, but what you what is very clear is to me looking at take matthew as an example is you have a setup from the get go about the jews you could take something that seems as innocent as could be and that is the infancy narrative of matthew which is strikingly different than luke but in in matthew's infancy narrative you have something in the story that seems very vestigial a white Magi from the east, whatever, from wherever they're coming from, they're coming to find the Messiah. And they're following a star, very famously, right? But when they come to the land of Israel, they, the star does not lead them to Bethlehem. They have to stop off in Herod's palace, where they ask the question, where is the Messiah to be born? And then Herod, Herod's not some scholar, so the priests and the Jewish scholars are consulted, and then this, this passage, which was raped by the church, raped by the church, Matthew 2, 6, of, from Mike, supposedly from Micah 5, 2. I mean, just cut in half and molested completely. Whoever did this should be thrown in prison immediately. And this is, of course, all M source. And then they're told that the Messiah is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Okay, so uh, very good. So then the Magi continue, 
and they go to Bethlehem, and the star stops right over the home of Jesus. Now remember, in Matthew's story, Jesus is born in Bethlehem. I mean, in Matthew's story, Jesus is born in his home, not in a barn, because it's a completely opposite. Now, every person has to ask the question, if a star has such magic powers that has a GPS, and it could go right to find, remember, they don't tell them what address it is in Bethlehem. They don't say, well, it's 106 Elm Street or Oak Street. The star knows where in Bethlehem is a city. The star knows where to take them. So why did you need the Herod part? Why do you need to stop off at Herod? The star can go straight to Bethlehem without stopping off at it. The reason is it's the setup, that they come to the Jews, Herod being the king of the Jews, and the Jews, when hearing that the Messiah is born in Bethlehem, what do they seek to do? To kill that baby. So Herod mm. ultimately goes to kill the baby. And, of course, they, they're told to go back a different way and not to tell them where it is and so on. But why did you need the story? The whole point is that these Gentiles coming from the East, they are pure. They're bringing presents. They're bringing all kinds of things for the Lord. They're worshiping the, the new baby Lord. And the Jews are trying to kill him. And, in, in fact, Herod then goes and kills all the babies, all the children born in Bethlehem. What is that for? That's the setup. That setup is there to show you that this is the response of a Gentile and a Jew to the Messiah. While the the Gentiles just are simple, they're not sophisticated like Jews, and they just want the truth, and they keep the secret. The Jews want to kill Christ just from the get-go. And that matches perfectly, seamlessly, what we find in the Passion Narrative, especially amped up, as Dr. Price says, in Matthew, because in Matthew, you have Pontius Pilate washing his hands of this. And only in Matthew, you have the, we're introduced to Pontius Pilate's wife, who has a dream that Jesus is completely innocent. And you have the Gentile. Jews, right? You have the Gentiles against the Jews once again. Yep. I mean, what could be more clear that I feel sorry for these Christians wow. that their their heads us. What could be more clear that once again we have the Gentiles and the Jews observing a spectacle? The Gentiles get it that Jesus is innocent or the object of worship, and the Jews are, are trying to kill him. So this is not this is not light stuff. This is a, an indictment against the Jews, and this also, in a sense, in my mind. This is what made me care about Christians. I used to hate them as a child. But then I realized, well, of course, if you are filled, if your brain is suffused with this with this ranting, with this vitriol, this, this is anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is just not the Jews are cheap. Anti-Semitism means that the Jews are demonic. We have to rid ourselves of the Jews. We, I mean, this is the Nazis are ultimately thinking this way. The Jews are, are, are untermenschen. It's not, it's a different kind of, and where does that come from? That all comes from the Christian Bible. Dr. Price, please, that was good. Yeah, uh, think of the uh, passage from the Q source that Matthew and Luke both have, where um, the centurion uh, comes to Jesus and says, uh, I've got a servant uh, suffering at home. Um, I, I know you can heal him. And Jesus says, well, okay, let's get going. He said, oh, no, no, uh, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but you don't need to. I know if you say be healed, even at a distance, it'll work. And so what is Jesus, which happened? Uh, and so um, what does Jesus say? I I've not found faith like this in Israel. <laughs> Ouch. Um, yeah. I was and, and it's, it's vital, for, I apologize, it's just vital oh. for the viewers to understand what a centurion meant. Hmm. A centurion was not a regular soldier or wasn't just a high-ranking soldier. A centurion was a person who had soldiers and slaves on them. He represented the empire. Hmm. When, when at, at the cross, this is really, I think, you know, how Mark, I mean, these are well-written books. That means they, they, deliver the, they deliver the juice. They deliver the heroin. They deliver the poison. Hmm. These are not poorly written stories or else we wouldn't be suffering from this. The, the, that you have the, the big secret of Mark that no one knows who Jesus is, but it's the centurion. The centurion is the 
high, high ranking kind of, he represents the empire. This is not just some, and the centurion at the cross says that behold, this is the son of God. The centurion recognizes what the Jews won't recognize. And it's, it's this contrast that is so, so damaging and that poisoned the mind of Christians. That's why at the Nuremberg trials, when, when Streicher, who was the editor of Der Strummer, who was, when he was on trial, he correctly said that there was nothing that I wrote, that he was the editor of the not, this Nazi propaganda paper. They said, there's nothing in the Schirma that you won't find in Luther's writings. And he was right. I wonder, and it's just throwing this out there to both you gentlemen to maybe chew on it and tell me your thoughts, because I love <clears throat> what I enjoy about doing interviews with you, Rabbi, is that you take a different um, – I'm so used to reading these from birth and like, well, not birth, but as a young kid, like we get indoctrinated and we just skip right over the important or is this important because we've always read the story like this and never really thought, how is this harming actual mm. Jews in real history or real in real life? That doesn't come to me. This Goyim never understood those things, you know, and it, it's becoming practical when I listen to you that it, this stuff does matter and, and mm. in history it mattered. One of the things about the Phoenician woman that I think, and I'd like to have your guys' thoughts, is the disciples rebuke Jesus. They start to get mad at him like a portrayal of how Jews are treating Goyim, period. Like, oh, no, what are you doing even talking to her? Like there's this slant towards the Phoenician woman, and Jesus is like, listen, they're right. You know, uh, the children, you're, this is the children's bread. Woman, great is your faith. Right. Another mm -hmm. Gentile here gets praised and almost looks better from the narrator's point of view than the disciples who are trying to tell him, what are you doing? Don't, what are you doing talking to her? And John does the same thing with the, the Samaritan, Samaritan woman. Yeah. yeah. So this, is this anti-Semitism going on here? Potentially I'm not saying that you might conclude that because you're very skeptical about making drawing conclusions, but well, it all does tend in that direction. Yeah. What do you think rabbi? Well, you know, th this is a very, very striking story, and it matches well to the pre-cross stories, where uh, the same Matthew go not into the way of the Gentile, the city of Samaritans, and not only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew chapter ten. The idea is that prior to the cross, in Matthew's view, the Jews are the chosen, and therefore the blessings belong to the Jew. So that when a Gentile woman comes to Jesus and says, please heal my daughter, she's vexed with the devil. Right? So Jesus doesn't want to, does, not interested in helping her. And then she runs to the disciples asking, maybe they'll intercede on her behalf. And then they're not interested in get her away from us. Really very, very striking story. And then she then goes back to Jesus asking for the blessing, and Jesus says, it is not, in the language of the King James, it is not me to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. And she then replies cleverly, you know, not these stories happen, but this is the way it's portrayed, but, it's, it, but even dogs eat from the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then she, then Jesus exclaims, as Dr. Price did, so what Matthew is trying to show that before, prior to the cross, it's the Jews that are chosen, and don't even preach the Gentiles. Don't even go to them. This is only for the Jews. But Matthew is playing on that veil that we find in the Synoptic Gospels that tears down. That is, prior to the cross, you have go only to the Jewish people. Don't even go with the non-Jews. But once the veil has been torn, a, ripped down asunder, which has historically never happened, then you can have the Great Commission at the end of Matthew now go into all nations. One other caveat, I think, is that it, it, it's very clear that the disciples are portrayed somewhat, there's a Yiddish word for it, it's called shlamazel or shlamil. That means that they, they the buffoon is too strong, but they, they're getting it wrong, and Jesus always has to sort of correct them. And they're, they're not, they're portrayed after the cross as Jesus like completely. And certainly in the book of Acts, they, 
they're on board. I mean, Peter still is a shlomazel. Shlomazel, the difference in the shlomazel in Jewish thinking and the shlomil is the shlomazel is the one who drops the banana peel, and the shlomil is the one who trips over the banana peel. So the the gentile the the apostles the apostles are portrayed as sort of not getting it all time. How do we handle other people that are healing in Jesus' name, that are calling out in Jesus' name? And so Jesus has got to kind of get them in the right direction. And here's another case of that. But yes, the, the Gentile, it comes off as someone who's, who's not as sharp as the Jew, but is well-meaning and has a there's no attack on Gentiles. They, they well meaning. They, they try. They don't have the sophistication of the Jew. But the Jew walks around with his wide phylacteries, right. praying loudly to everyone here. That's the whole theme. It, it, it all really works. When I say works well, I mean it all matches. It all falls into place, and that's that's our story. Uh, in. Uh in the in Matthew 10 with what I call the not so great commission. Yeah, no, don't waste your time with Gentiles. Just go to Jews, the house of Israel and all that. Notice that he in, anticipates, of course, you're going to be persecuted every town you go in. Uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, and that then the contrast between that and the great commission, all the nations that reminds me so much of in the book of acts where three times Paul's getting out opposition from Jews and says, okay, look, I'm done with you. I'm going to the Gentiles from now on. They'll listen. I see the same sort of thing in the comparison of the two commissions in Matthew. It's like, uh, and this is an anachronism as well, because like in uh, Romans 9 through 11, there's this actually kind of friendly treatment saying, yeah, yeah, Jews are blind to the gospel now, but but that's the will of God. And ultimately they're going to come around and uh, hop on the bandwagon and everybody will be saved. But the, um, the uh, idea that uh, he doesn't say Jews are going to be damned, they'll have their chance, but that's apocalyptic. He expects that to happen pretty soon. Uh, and yet the idea that like in, in First Thessalonians and also in Romans, that, well, okay, Jews have rejected Jesus. Isn't If, if this is written in the 50s CE, isn't that a little early? Could that have been clear to Christians that the Jews en masse have rejected Jesus? Surely that's, that's a later uh, thing. And so that's one of the reasons I suspect the Pauline epistles are not actually early or mid-first century works. But... Mm -hmm. uh, an, an, an like a supersessionist anachronism, like right. you're saying. <clears throat> this is, is it possible? Uh, just a question: Is it possible? Uh, I'll tell you how I always processed Romans. That Romans is an outlier because Paul is speaking to Jews he's never met. I mean, the Book of Romans is addressing a church that presumably Paul has never visited. He will, and he's speaking to a mixture of both Jews and Gentiles, because you have Romans 7 as an example. Paul is addressing his brethren and uses the uh, the parable or the example of a woman whose husband died, and therefore you don't have to keep the law. So I always thought that Romans was easier on the Jews, and that's why Paul will say in Romans 3 that, you know, to the Jews was given all the oracles because Paul spoke out of two sides of his mouth, more than two sides. But here he was nervous. It wasn't like speaking to Galatians, where his audience is all Gentiles. Here he's speaking to Jews. So that's how I always processed it. Well, that does make sense. He's uh, he's respectful. He, he doesn't come quite out and say this, but there's room, uh, it seems to me, uh, for saying that uh, Paul isn't represented as saying Jews who become Christians uh, you don't uh, that he that he is saying Jews who become Christians. You want to continue to keep uh, the Torah and Jewish customs. That's fine. Just don't try to force it on these uh, ex pagans. Uh, but um, who knows? It's not quite that clear, and that may be on purpose. Uh, that uh, if uh, he's if we know he's saying, look, 
Gentiles aren't Jews, this is asking them to accept alien cultural mores. Is that really what Christianity is about? No, it's about faith in, in Christ and baptism and so on. Uh, so he, he might have just meant uh, that, um, and I see a bit of this in Romans, that Gentiles don't worry about it, but Jews, hey, all right, no problem. But yeah. he doesn't quite sew it up, so who knows? I must say, Rabbi, <clears throat> Jews have had a funny place in church eschatology. Yeah, hysterical. I know. I'm not kidding. I'm just, it's really a laugh all the way. It's still a blast, I'll tell you. I don't have to drink or do drugs. I just read the New Testament. And I'm high as a, kind. a lot of fundamental. It's a big pleasure. There's no pleasure than opening up the New Testament. Anytime I have insomnia, I can't sleep. Forget the ambient. I just go right to the New Testament. <laughs> <laughs> you know, course, is, there's no bigger pleasure than a New Testament. Every time a Jew has a problem, we read the New Testament and realize we have bigger problems. <laughs> ahead, I'm sorry. Well, you know, I know this is a crazy sounding thing, but you mentioned the horrible protocols of the elders of Zion, which depicts this uh, conspiracy of. Uh, uh, big bucks, Jewish uh, tyrants wanting to rule the world, and here's how we're going to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, in one of my books, I said, you know, the story of the Sanhedrin uh, meeting to deliberate about Jesus and finally condemning him, with the impact this has had, this is like an early version of the protocols of the elders of, of Zion. Mm. Of course, of course, that, ex that is exactly it. The, the hatred of Jews is very different than the hatred of other groups. The idea is, it, it's very interesting that when you listen to anti-Semites and ask them, why do you hate the Jews? You, you, you'll get answers, and the answers will include all sorts of things. Um, moderate, they you know control the banks and the media. Uh, worse, they you know poison the wells and are you know and they want to you know kill destroy the world. But the one thing that is said as a pejorative against other peoples, but it's never said about the Jews. I'm talking about from anti semites is they never say we hate the Jews because they're stupid. Never. Because if you said that, if David Duke would say we hate the Jews because they're so stupid, so he would be laughed out of town. Even the anti-Semite knows that that one is not going to get any traction. Everybody knows that the Jews have a reputation. So that's why you can't say the Jews just don't get it because they're dumb, because they're thick. You have to, it has to be demonic. And that's why, as I said, these stories are very well shaped. I I am sure, I mean, as sure as I could be, that Mark is, is just the oldest surviving gospel, but this was developed over time. Very creative, highly literate Greeks were, were these stories are just developed, both oral and written. But all of this is to explain why is it a people that have a reputation among their enemies as being clever? And why do they reject Christ? This is a good question to ask about Sanhedrin in light of the anti-Semitism here. Um, <clears throat> when the Sanhedrin go to punish Jesus or really uh, rule him out as guilty, um, the strange thing about the Synoptic Gospels, and maybe even John, you can comment on this since you guys have wrapped your heads around this a lot. I'm sure you have, Rabbi, and I'd love to hear your thought on this. It appears that it's taking place like at a very holy time, which no one would ever do something like uh. that, historically speaking. So is this, in effect, actually disrespecting the holy days of the Jews in the actions that they're really making Jews act like, you know what, those days didn't matter to them either. They didn't not only care about Jesus and the Christ, but you know, they didn't even keep their own stuff right. They're hypocrites and this and this and that, like a kind of, you see what I'm trying to get well, at? Well, that could be, but I have a hunch that's giving them too much credit. I think modern New Testament scholars uh, think they know more about Judaism than the gospel. Well, they're right. They know more about Judaism than the gospel writers who, especially Mark, who like in chapter seven, uh, misattributes some of these dietary laws the, the, observed by Hellenistic Jews to Palestinian Jews. And, and he 
treats it like it's a kind of a Discovery Channel travel log. Here are the quaint <laughs> customs of these Jews. Uh, whereas I, I think it's vilifying them, and it, it, there there is that. Like this, imagine the scene. It's Passover evening, and a pious Jewish family is going through the ritual, and and one of them happens to look out the window and says, "What the hell? That that's." Caiaphas, the high priest, where's he going? It's Passover Eve. He has to be at home. I don't think that even occurred to the evangelists uh, mm -hmm. that they uh, just uh, were ignorant of the, the what what the customs were. Hmm. Okay. Well, hmm. I just didn't know they're, if you thought. They're using only using the customs as a device, as Doctor Price says. They weren't that sophisticated. That wasn't the and their audience certainly would have not would have known very, very little. But the, um, take an example of, of John, which is very telling, because John places Jesus' crucifixion a day earlier than the Synoptic Gospels. And John does this it's in plain sight because he wants Jesus to be the Lamb of God, John 1, 29 and 36. And therefore, you have this scene that would never appear in the Synoptic Gospels that the Jews refused to enter into the essentially the palace of Pontius Pilate because they didn't want to become defiled because they have to eat from the Passover lamb. This is a, this is a fascinating scene. In the Synoptics, this would be impossible. Remember, in the Synoptic Gospels, by the time you get to the day Jesus was crucified, the Jews already ate the Passover lamb last night. The Last Supper is a Passover Seder. In John 13, it's not a Passover Seder. It's a, it's a supper, but it's not a Seder, and they're washing the feet. Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. So what happens is there's a, I don't know what to call it, clever, but it's very transparent. It's naked of what's going on here. And that is that if, in fact, this is the 14th day of Nisan, it means the day before Passover, the night, when nightfall occurs, that's when the next day, then, then it the, becomes the 15th. So they didn't yet eat the Passover lamb. So therefore, John uses this device that a Jew would not go into a Gentile's home. The reason for it is manifold, but most importantly is Gentiles had a practice of burying their dead in their own home, and it was a place considered defiled. The Jews had to be in a state of purity to eat from the Passover lamb, so much so, so that the Torah has a provision, a second Passover, in case someone didn't make it. That means they were contaminated for whatever reason. But in 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 John's Gospel, you can use this plot device to amp it up that the Jews are so concerned about keeping their festival and remaining pure and not going into the, the palace, but yet they're about to kill Christ. And, and you, you see this, this device is all over the place. You see it. I don't know why everyone seems to miss this, but you see it also at the, at the supper in John 13, where Judas Iscariot is leaving the dinner with a bag of money. And in verse 29, you know, the disciples are wondering, why is he leaving so quick with the money? And they conclude that he's using the money to purchase the goods, the needs for the festival. That couldn't happen to Matthew, Mark, and Luke because they already ate it already. So this is all preposterous. I mean, you know, what you said earlier, Derek, is that you know you read this as a kid, this Christian story, and it's almost a rockabye baby like a lullaby where you just don't even hear what's being said. But when you look at the text fresh, it just blows up in your face. So I don't think the the writers, as Dr. Price said, were sophisticated enough to start to say, well, what are the Pharisees doing holding a Sanhedrin or court on on Passover day before? They wouldn't they wouldn't know one from another. The only thing that's clear in the gospels the Jews are saying, and John has this right, that we can't Hmm. kill anybody. We can't do that. John has that in there. But they're using Jewish customs, which are very well known. It's it's like today. People know we're, we're small people. We're one quarter of 1% of the world's population, but people are very, very familiar with the Judaism. So people very much knew about the Passover and about these laws of defilement. And of course, I think it would shock anyone going, you're about to kill the Son of God, and you're just worried about being pure about eating a lamb that night, that is that I think just hits everyone in the face. It sounds anti-Torah is what I'm trying to get at. And 
in, in effect, the anti-Semitism that we're kind of been hinting at here, <clears throat> it's a slap at you're willing to try and obey a law, but you're willing to kill the son of God. You are making, and, and that seems to be the hint, even in Paul, when Paul's talking about, don't worry about the law anymore. Like it seems gospels come after Paul, at least if you take that, that sequence, Paul's already setting the groundwork, like the law is no more. And these Jews won't let go of that law. And it's so important. They'll kill the son of God. And just to follow a dietary law or something, you know what I mean? Something in effect, but they're straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Right. That's how uh, they're playing it. And this is also uh, like the good Samaritan parable in Luke, uh, mm -hmm. where who, who is it that uh, leaves the guy in the ditch? Uh, good luck, buddy. Uh, it, it's a, uh, it's a, a Sadducee and a Levite or a priest and a Levite uh, because I'm sorry I'm on my way to the temple and I have to maintain ritual purity so good luck uh, it's it's certainly and, and who is the guy that helps him? A heretical Samaritan I mean that's going to be some kind of <laughs> it's, it, that's what I'm kind of getting at and sometimes the clear anti-Semitism that you're pointing out that's the stuff that like you know, we don't think that way. I, I didn't think that way. But you're pointing out like obvious things that Jews have been acknowledging from the get. This is not new. This is something that has been going on for a long time. Jews have recognized the the obviously the reaction mm. from the Gentiles towards them throughout history, but also they've been noticing this anti-Semitism from day one, and uh, probably because of the reaction, the church mm. probably gave them that reaction in the second century. Mm. So I I, I know that. And, and this could be mistaken here. I'm going off the scholars, Ishe Rosensby and, and uh, the gentlemen that I read on Goyim, but they talked about the binary structure between Jew and Gentile, and that a lot of that was reactionary in light of the fact that the church had ended up hijacking the Jewish terms and then says, well, you're either a follower of Christ, a Christian, or a heathen. They hijacked this binary structure and came up with their own structure, and Jews kind of fit into that paradigm, depending on the church father. I think one of the church father's origin or one of these guys allowed Jews their own category. That's why I was saying earlier, Jews have a funny place in the Christian church. Ask a pre mill dispensationalist who's waiting on the rapture. Well, they, they're still God's chosen people, but God paused when he was going to help them, and He's going to unpause it one day when he takes the church out of here and he's going to work on the ethnic national Jews and save them, whether all of them or some of them. Some of the church says, nice try, buddy. Good, good luck. The church replaced Israel. The true people of God are the spiritual ones in Christ. So it just sounds, looking at it from your eyes, like this does have a anti-Semitic uh, it just inevitably is going to draw that kind mm. of line, no matter what. You're taking something that was uh, that comes from the Jewish world and then giving it your own mm. spin. I don't know. You know what I mean? Yes, and I think uh, this has to do also with uh, something that I'm kind of scotch taping this together from Richard Rubenstein, uh, who was one of the Jew, a Jewish death of God theologian in the 60s. He wrote a book called After Auschwitz, which was fascinating. And he, he says, look, if God allowed Auschwitz, uh, forget about the covenant. He, he really went way out there. Uh, but he said, why are why have Jews been persecuted? Well, because uh, they claimed to be God's favorites and Christians uh, resented that because they wanted to be God's favorites. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm putting him together with... Uh, uh, Rene Girard, who I, I think really explained or unpacked what uh, Rubenstein was saying, he said there's this mimetic desire that you've got Jews and Christians. The Christians say, hey, Old Testament, that's ultimately where we come from. We, we like those books. We like those prophets and stuff. But there's this idea that uh, they remain a separate group because they don't believe in Jesus. And, and so you, you have this, re Christians have this resentment 
resentment toward Jews. Uh, they admire them and want to be like them, but they also hate them because they want what Jews have, the status of God's chosen. And that leads to attempts. It's like that guy that killed John Lennon. He was a fanatical John Lennon fan. Wow. Uh, and that's the dynamic and all those things. You love him so much, you must become the person. And to do that, you have to replace him. And to do that, you got to kill him. I mean, this happens again and again, wow. fan murders. And I, I think that that's, uh, I think Rubenstein plus Gerard sort of explain why there's this fanatical, murderous envy. And because uh, a uh, Christians don't feel that way about Muslims or Hindus or anything. Uh, it's because of the historical continuity and the embarrassing fact that Jews don't accept it. Like you said, the, the, they have the Bible that we're quoting uh, in, in the interest of our guy, but uh, they it's like a, pro, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. Mm -hmm. In the real world, why is that? Because they know him too well. Uh, and uh, that's uh, something like that is going on there. Hmm. Uh, Jews say, look, trust us. We know what, what these texts say. Uh, you're making it up. And, uh, and so that uh, Christians don't like that, obviously. Right. I mean, they're busy like Josh McDowell and Hal Lindsey. Oh, he is on the Jesus on the cross, and that alone over three hundred Old Testament prophecies. Well, <laughs> get the hell out of here! That's ridiculous. Yeah, Rabbi, yeah. I just wanted to say one more interesting thing, and and I'd like to get into the Gospel of John with you guys, if you don't mind getting into a few more examples on some of the tendencies in the Gospel of John, because you've said that's the most anti-Semite. Uh, gospel is John from your perspective. Yeah, but it's it's certainly arguable either way. They both have plenty. Okay, of it's, a, it's a great contest. What a terrific yeah, contest! This, 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 is a, this is like the Olympics. <laughs> who could be the biggest anti-Semite? <laughs> this is only a question of who gets the gold and who gets the silver. This is not. <laughs> <laughs> that's all we have here. It's a shade. It's a, a good case could be made for both. Well, but, yeah. One one quick question. You guys have read the history books. I'm sure you've heard this. Um and. I'd like to know why is it that Nazi Germany, other anti-Semites uh, that believe in Jesus, who was a Jew, uh, hate Jews? What, what is is there? Oh, some ultimately, you know what they say: Jesus, Jesus was not a Jew. Really? Yeah, there, there's that's pretty common in all these like Christian identity lunatic groups. They say uh, they bring in the Khazars uh, from uh, Central Asia. Uh, apparently, historically, a bunch of them did convert to Judaism. Well, these people are um, saying, ah, yes, and they dominated Judaism, so that today's Jews are not biblical Israelites. And and neither was Jesus because he was from Galilee of the Gentiles. Uh, and and th there's uh, it's like gross oversimplification to the point of distortion. But that's what they do take it logically uh, that, um, that Jesus wasn't a Jew. What's going on in John? Can you give us some examples of John and, and what we're seeing going on? with anti-Semitism in, in that gospel specifically? You want to start us out, uh, Dr. Price? Well, the theory, which I still think is a good one, though some don't anymore, is that we, we read that around 80 to 90, there was a move to kick Jewish Christians out of the synagogue by adding to the 18th benediction in the, the synagogue liturgy uh, a curse on the minim and or the Nazareans, though there are different texts of this. Uh, and so uh, you're thanking God that you're not one of these heretics. And uh, the idea was, we're not telling Christians to get out, but they're certainly not going to be praying a curse down on themselves. So we got them. Uh, and that a uh, bunch of them, okay, I'm not staying where I'm not wanted. And, and they retreated out of it. And uh, that um, John is talking about that in the story of the, the man born blind that Jesus heals. The word had already gone out that whoever believed in Jesus was to be kicked out of the synagogue mm. and his parents were afraid so they wouldn't uh, uh, say anything about him. And then he anachronistically predicts during the Last Supper that uh, that is going to happen one day. But then John, the whole gospel is taking things from the writer's day and 
pre and putting the back into the time of Jesus so he right. can comment on the mm -hmm. trends. Uh, but that that's the theory is that that's what uh, John is is smarting over that uh, we've been rejected and therefore Jesus has been rejected and uh, and yet ironically we're the true Jews. I think mm -hmm. Matthew is also. Um, in on that in a way because it's the context to me seems to be formative Judaism as Neusner calls it that uh, that Judaism is being reorganized after the destruction of the temple and there's a new strictly religious uh, Sanhedrin at Yavna and they're they're like sort of uh, reconstituting and, and uh, reformulating Judaism well it looks to me like Matthew is uh, arguing against them which is why you have the thing in chapter 23. Uh, the, the Pharisees uh, don't um, keep the law, but nonetheless, they sit on the, the, the throne of Moses, and uh, which is actually a piece of furniture in second century synagogues. Uh, so whatever they say, uh, do it, but don't be like them because they're a bunch of hypocrites. Why would he bother? I, I can't really see Paul doing that. I mean, I, 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 yeah, Paul would just say, well, they're wrong, they're blind. But Matthew still seems to think that Christians belong in the Jewish community, and he's fighting against the, the rabbis at Yavna uh, hmm. and, uh, or their heirs. Uh, and so that that's, it's again like a kind of mimetic rivalry. We're the genuine article. And those hmm. guys, uh, to hell with them. But that's just hmm. one of the theories. Yeah, I, I think that the the clearest way to chart what's going on in the Gospels is the passion narratives. That's where it really that's where the anti-Semitism explodes, and you could chart this really easily by just looking at how Mark, the earliest surviving Gospel, portrays the culpability of the Jews for Jesus' death and exonerates Pontius Pilate. So mm -hmm. what you would expect to find is exactly what we encounter in the Gospels. You know, as different as John is from the Synoptics, here, it's letting alone what day he was crucified on and, and who discovers him in the cave, forget all that stuff. But this part is really just a, a trajectory. Whereas in Mark, it's still the Jews who are responsible for coming to Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate is agreeable you know, to it, but reluctantly. This is not Pontius Pilate's idea. But what, as you move through to, uh, to Matthew and Luke, the culpability of the Jews and the innocence of Pontius Pilate demonstrated, as Dr. Price said, with you know, Pontius Pilate washing his hands of this, uh, you know, that's very, very transparent. But once you get to John, so the the hatred of the Jew and the culpability of the Jews for Jesus is completely upon the head of the Jew to the point that you only find in John where Pontius Pilate actually says, you, you take him and crucify him, and he's speaking to Jews. That means in the language of John, it's actually the Jews who are given Jesus to be taken away to be crucified. In the synoptics, it's the Roman soldiers. So there you have, and you have that that ridiculous dialogue as though Pontius Pilate is some you know, guy who could just be moved by a Jewish crowd. We know the history of what kind of personality Pontius Pilate was. He was no, he was no slouch. No, it was all this is all nonsense. And as Dr. Price said, this is of course the protocols of the elders of Zion. It's just all over again. The Jews control the most powerful people in the world. But in there, you have directly the dialogue where Jesus says to Pilate that your sin is nothing. I can even demonstrate this because if you further. Because if we go to the non-canonical Gospels, um, Peter, for example, which didn't make it in, there the Jews even look worse. Mm -hmm. So it's just the further you get from wherever this all started. I don't know. Something preceded the Book of Mark, and it was in writing. There was no doubt oral traditions, but it just amps up, amps up the response of the culpability of the Jews and also the responsibility of the Romans received to the point that 
to the point that Pontius Pilate could be considered a saint in the Ethiopian church, which is mind blowing. Yeah. Mind blowing that the guy who killed, who, who had Jesus executed, he's not just an okay guy, but he's a saint worthy of veneration. And is they're okay right. Laughing? Is, I mean, is it okay? Because I did think this is just, it, it makes me chuckle how silly, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's like you you can't make the stuff up. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wonder if that's already anticipated in Matthew, where his wife sends him that note. Have nothing to do with this righteous man, because mm -hmm. I've suffered greatly for his sake in a dream. It, now, I always assume that man she's tossing and turning in this nightmare, and it's a bad omen, which it probably is. But I thought, in light of this later recorded thing where Pilate becomes a saint. Is this implying that Procula, as they call his wife, is is fated to be martyred for her faith with in Jesus? That she's suffering because of Jesus in the future hmm. and she's trying to avoid it? I don't know. But it once like you say, the trajectory, once you realize this is where it's gonna end up, it, it makes me take a second look at that. Right. And it's it's not an accident that all the the church tradition. This is a later, much later development. This is really third century, where you have basically everybody gets killed, and Pontius Pilate commits suicide out of regret and thing, and all except for John. John has to live a long time because they know John is written late. So how did he survive to write in ninety ninety five whatever it was? So they had to have that John almost got killed. He almost was so close to getting killed, but he didn't get killed. They put him in a frying pan, but he made it. So why did everybody get killed? Was because in fact this was the destiny of the suffering that you're going to have to suffer many things from the Jews. Yeah, you know, I just uh, this is a point just to for the viewer to see how ridiculous this is. The Jews are often mocked. Going back to the earliest right church fathers, for their suffering, and the church fathers, the apostolic fathers, all said, "We have Melito." I mean, this is early stuff saying that why did the Jews suffer so much? Why was the temple destroyed? Why did the Romans kill so many Jews? It's because the Jews rejected Christ. That's why the Jews suffer so much. And Augustine writes plenty about this in his Magnum Opus, The City of God. But conversely, they would never apply the same logic to the suffering of all the Christians. That means if suffering means that you're wrong, if and suffering is the result of your that you're rebellion against God, when the Jews suffer for sure, the reason why the Jews suffer so much is because of the worst people in the world. They killed Christ and they're the enemies of God. And this is a testimony that they're evil. But when Christians suffer, ah, huh, different suffering for God. This holy thing. This isn't what I mean. I mean, this is such unequal weights and measurements. I mean, apply suffering one way or the other, but this is the game that's played. And I know, you know, I'm saying this to the viewer that I Christians don't know this. They don't think about this, but it does. It gets in there. You know, you you talked about this, Derek, earlier, Doctor Price. What I'm shocked about is really how little. Christians know about their own Bible. That blows my mind away. Mm -hmm. That they really have, they can go to midnight mass and have a, a play, and Matthew and Luke are just conflated together and they don't notice it. They really know very little about their own. It always shocked me. But the toxic message does blow through, does come through. And, you know, Christian hatred, which is, I believe, what is all anti-Semitism emerges from, is so toxic, it, 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 the transmission ability of it to, to it, when, when we go from Christian Russia, from Tsarist Russia, to a revolution, although the revolution is now a, a, an empire that rejects God, but the Christian anti-Semitism remains, and the Soviet Union displays the same anti-Semitism towards the Jews. The Christian anti-Semitism, that remains. Christianity has to be suppressed, but not the anti-Semitism. That's too good. And they go with that. So sure. it, it, it comes through very clearly to me, and I think I have the benefit of really having encountered this literature 
you know, as a 17, 18 year old, meaning that's the first time I'm reading this. So for me, every detail, every curve, any nuance is just very, very clear to me, but it may blow right past someone who's just born with this stuff. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just thinking of it and I don't know why this came to mind. <clears throat> it's like that nursery rhyme, ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. And as a kid, you're playing in the playground, you're singing a song, you're just, you're just having fun. You don't realize that this was, and there's alternate theories. I just had to quickly pull it up just to give it a look. There are alternate theories. Some say this is from the, the plague, yeah. the black plague. Mm -hmm. Some say this is from English histories of, of real traumatic, catastrophic, plague-like scenarios in in England, but that song as kids were like, ring around the rosy, and you're just having fun singing a song. Well, reading the New Testament and hearing your pastor preach from the, from hmm. the pulpit, all that is like ring around the rosy, and you don't realize <clears throat> what it has been portrayed as now to Christian audiences is, you know, blanketed, it's filtered, it's, it's siphoned through a man who's trying to, you know, come with his own intentions of being nice and kind. He has good intentions. Mm -hmm. I'm not knocking just like you're not knocking that Christians like for the most part, aren't anti-Semitic mm -hmm. in many respects. Maybe Roman Catholics have tendencies to do that. I don't really know. My dad's a Roman Catholic, but he doesn't seem that way. Um, I'm just saying there's probably different kinds of Christianities that are like that, but their books in effect, without us realizing it, singing the song ring around the rosy, John chapter 20, verse this John chapter is there's a sinister initial purpose behind it that we didn't realize as we sing the song. And that's what mm -hmm. I'm thinking is going on here potentially. And I think rabbi's got some really good points. I loved how he brought up Matthew, how, why'd they stop at Herod? Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of slap in the face is this? It does seem like a slap in the face and, you know, pat yourself on the back. You got it, Mr. Reader, you got it. Mm -hmm. And if they ignore this, go go shoot yourself you know what i mean pretty much because you're ignoring the truth because that's what the author wants you to do is believe what he's mm. selling you and um i'm glad i'm not stuck in that paradigm um i would like to see more people question these books mm. and test this stuff for their own life and and um that that's kind of my own angle on this but i've never thought to think of those text the way that you presented them rabbi i've never thought about it like that it never i never thought anti-semitism was that big of a deal in the new testament i really didn't i didn't notice it, it blows it blows through every story really and every not every almost every story in in the gospels talking about in jesus the ministry stories is jesus trying healing somebody on the sabbath and the jews go and are condemning him i mean that's Every, every story. There's no story of, you know, Jesus playing baseball and the Puerto Ricans come over and say, you don't know how to play it. This is all the Jews. There are no Eskimos in it. It's really a book about Jews who are the enemies of God. It's really every single story. And although it's it's called the lullaby effect, you know, lullaby baby, you may have ring around the rosy may be a question of what the words mean, but the... Um, Lullaby baby is really very obvious. You have a cradle falling off a tree like you're trying to kill me, mom. But people really miss the words, but the story comes through. Here's the strange thing. I'll share this with you because I have I've very little. I have not been a gentile for very long. I'm kidding. So, But it, it, in truth, it, it made me, conversely, this is the strange thing, like Christians and care about Christians. The anti-Semitism in the New Testament conveyed to me that Christians are not bad people and they are the victims of the literature. And it, it completely changed my worldview after I was done with rabbinical school. So prior to that, when I was a kid growing up, you know, I was born 15 years after the Holocaust. Mm. All around me was people with numbers on their arm. Mm -hmm. Almost all my family was murdered in the in the spring of 1944 in Hungary, just wiped out. With very very few people survive, very few. And this is the world that was my world, and it was all Christians. You know, um, Germany during World War II was 65% Lutheran, 35% Catholic, and some other 
So every that so I thought they I really thought that the Gentiles are really completely evil and psycho and just stay away from them. And the last thing in the world I was interested in as a child. So that's my world is to they try to and I see a Catholic church. I, I grew up in Borough Park, Brooklyn, and it's a very Jewish area. But there was one Catholic church, Holy Ghost, on 17th Avenue. And it just and there was a there, there was a statue of Mary in the in the front lawn of the church. I'm going, these people are crazy. They have a statue there, they don't know the Ten Commandments, they have priests going around with a yarmulke on their head. I didn't understand what's going on here. I just knew this was really bad and these people were really evil. The strange thing was is that as I began to to absorb the Christian Bible, I realized where this was coming from. And therefore, I realized that these people are not evil, but rather the victims of a toxic literature that transformed their mind, that filled their hearts up with hatred, and that's why they're responding that way. And then I began to go, well, not so bad. They, considering what the literature says, they don't treat me that bad. They just run after me, calling me a Christ killer and spitting at me. And I don't know how it is, but Catholics know how to spit. I don't know what it is. I don't know if there's a... <laughs> They could spit. You could have a kid, a, an Italian Catholic kid, could spit a mile away and knock a a pee off a branch. I don't know how they did it. I I got plenty of it, but they did at least didn't stab me. So I, so what happened is when I read the literature and began to realize a number of things. We're talking about the hatred in the New Testament. I realized, oh, these people, whether they were Catholics and really didn't learn a lot of the texts, as I imagine Catholics don't. But still, the storytelling mm. in the church goes on. The priest is telling stories from the Gospels. Mm -hmm. That goes on in any church, whether it's Protestant, whether it's a Southern Baptist church, or whether it's a Catholic church. It's true, the Catholic churches are very liturgical as the Orthodox are, but they're all getting the stories. And the story is the Jew is there. There's no, it's the Jews. So in that case, it made me then care about Christians and realize they're not genetically bad, but this has been toxic for them. And therefore, my heart is very open to them. And I want to, I, I still want to, of course, I protect my people. They shouldn't be converted by these people, by evangelical, but I care about them. I go, okay, I know why you feel that way about me. It's not you. It's not in the breast milk, but it's really in the text that has toc that has, has such a toxic effect on your mind. And I get that now. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, uh, that that's great. Mm. You got me emotional there for a second, Rabbi, and um, I'm sorry about history and the way that things have gone. As you should be sorry. I know. But I'm kidding. You <laughs> no, I mean, just thinking about your family like that. You know, you got me. Well, every, that's every, every, that's every, a look, whole, whole another thing, man. And that's uh, like I, I, we'll we'll do it on another show. But just you know, for the Jew, his whole world is really is anth. I mean. Everything is filtered through through the ever-present hatred of our nation. As we say in the Passover Seder, in every generation, the nations rose up against us. And, and the Almighty has to interfere, has to reach into every stage of history to save us. You know, one of the things that you discover when you study Jewish history, no matter what your background is and what your beliefs are, I think any sober mind has to wonder how did the Jews ever survive this? I mean, really, I mean, if you study Jewish history of any time, pick your time, how do they ever get through that? Mm. Not just how do they get through the expulsion from Spain in the, in the end of the 15th century, how do they get through the 13th century? If you read about what the Jews endured, no other nation would survive that. How did we ever survive the destruction of the Second Temple? Se Second Temple's destruction was, un let me just say it, it was something horrific. I can't go into it now. So this is ever present for the Jew of what the nations will do to us. And this is, of course, you know, living in Jerusalem where the people who who protect me I, are not Europeans, but they're, they're Israelis, Jews, there are Arabs in the military and so on. But I mean, living in a Jewish country, this is an oasis for us, the Jewish people. 
I'm speaking to you from Yerushalayim, from Jerusalem now. And for us, this little place that we have returned to after all these thousands of years, an unprecedented event in the annals of history that the Jews returned, this is our oasis. But I do have, my heart is broken for the nations of the world, really. And it's because, it, it's it's counterintuitive, it's because the text is far worse than I, I knew when I was opening up that blue King James, that red letter edition, as a teenager, I knew I was not, this was not going to be the Hardy Boys. I knew <laughs> this, this is going to, I had no clue, nothing could have possibly prepared me for what I was going to encounter. But then when I started to read through it and go, oh, now I understand what's happening. So that, and then meeting some very nice evangelicals, then I went, okay, now I got what's going on. And that's why my heart is tender for them. But this is ever present for the Jewish people. One other caveat historically, it's, it's impossible to compare Christians today, in my view, than before World War II, before the Holocaust. I mean, the church did things and said things during the Holocaust that they don't say anymore. Yeah. You know, <laughs> The Second Vatican Council could not have occurred you know, in the 1860s. It, it couldn't have. The, the idea that the, the Catholics would say perfect as a Jew. So the, the, I can understand why, you know, why, why, why it would be removed by the, what's called the Papa Bueno. In, in, he didn't even survive the end of Vatican II. Where you can have Nostra Ted, you can have these kind of, these are not great documents, but they're that, that was inconceivable in the 17th century. They could have never pulled that off. But it's also called a post-Auschwitz theology. You can't compare the way Christians will talk about the Jews today mm. the way they talked about us in the 19th century. That's incomparable. I mean, this, the, the World War II, the Shoah, the Holocaust, you know, changed the world forever, of course. Dr. Mm. Price, do you have anything you'd like to say in well, yeah, in fact, uh, sometimes some of these folks have gone a lot farther than I never, than I ever thought I would live to see. Uh, for instance, I remember uh, some years ago seeing Ann Coulter on TV saying to a Jewish guy who was some kind of commentator. Yeah, you know, yeah that's right. She said uh, that she believes Jesus is the way. And she said, however, don't worry. Jews are going to heaven, too. Mm. <laughs> wow. And she's a conservative evangelical. There's actually a movement of Christians like that. Uh, John Hagee and others, uh, they they pretty much you know, just say, look, uh, the Jews are going to heaven. There's certain groups of Christians like that that are like not. Hagee, that, so Hagee is an outlier. So Hagee holds to what's called dual covenant theology. In fact, they discussed this in volume one. That's very strange. The dual covenant theology means that Hagee his, believes that Christianity is only for the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And the and Christians should not try to convert the Jews because the Jews just have to keep the Torah and that's how they're saved. And Hagee came under enormous attack on on this view. He's not the only one. There are there are Christians who are evangelicals as he is who believe that. But this is this is an outlier. And he holds that yes, they should bring the gospel to Muslims. They should bring the gospel to uh, to Hindus. He he I quote him in an interview he did with Houston Chronicle years ago. So Hagee is very strange. And I've had quite a number of conversations with him personally about this. But Hagee is completely surrounded by evangelical Christians who want to convert the Jews. And they are dispensationalists, meaning they come from that worldview largely that holds that the covenant with the Jews has not been abrogated. And the ideas that John Nelson Darby advanced in the 19th century, but still they hold that if you, you don't accept Jesus, you're going to hell as a Jew. They do believe those who are dispensationalists 
dispensations believe that the that the covenant belongs to the Jew, which means the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people, the blessings belong to Jews, but those are earthly blessings, heavenly blessings, and the body of Christ is neither Jew nor Gentile, as Galatians 3 ends. So the, the Hagee is a strange one there, saying he's a dual covenant guy, and that's why some of his books had to be retracted and reprinted without this, because Jerry Falwell went, went ballistic when Hagee put out a book while he was alive saying this. He, he got himself in a lot of trouble with that. No, I I wrote an article back in, I think, 1980 that was published in the Journal of Ecumenical Studies called An Evangelical Version of the Double Covenant uh, Theology. And I said dispensationalism doesn't exactly say this, but it wouldn't take much of an adjustment for them to say it. And maybe that's what happened with him. I, mean, I think that right. you've even said to me, in, you know, in our conversations just off air, that uh yeah, Paul, there's a this strange thing that Paul's doing doesn't seem like he's concerned for Jews. You know what I mean? Like, it, and there's that critical thinking, of course, because when you get into Dr. Price's head, Dr. Price can play the role of consensus and say, oh, yeah, seven authentic, others are pseudepigraphical and all. But in his mind, you, you know, he plays that role for everyone in the public, right? He can do that. He can go there for everyone else to speak the language. But how often does the person listening to Dr. Price go where Dr. Price goes in his thinking and say, okay, highly critical of every single book, don't care what consensus says here, and consider that maybe some of the stuff's inserted, interpolated, added, meshed together, you know, woven pieces of doctrines like doc, – uh, like, Paul will say one thing then contradict himself in the very next chapter or in the end of the same chapter. You know, is this some, you know, woven together literature and saying that to say they're trying to orthodox Paul and make mm. Paul balanced to be pro-Jewish as well as Gentile, where you've said it's possible that initially it was a Gentile movement altogether. And what they've done is they patched the Judaism sect, if you will, or a Messianic uh, Judaism type of sect of Christianity with a Gentile type Christology. And here you have them being married in the text of the New Testament and being polished by early church fathers. So don't know if it's true. I'm just throwing it out there for rabbis. Well, I don't know if it's true, though I think it's a viable possibility. It would make sense just one point in Hagee's vein of thought. Hagee's trying to keep both. Hmm. And the early church fathers are trying to unite whoever the authors are that are patching up these stories. No matter who you are, even if you say the consensus seven or Paul, there's a problem between Paul and James. There's a problem between these two sects, hmm. no matter how you chop it. Yeah. One is Torah, one's saying no Torah. One's almost hmm. saying, in a sense, no Gentiles, because technically one's trying to convert them, circumcise, become a participant, become an active covenant member. The other saying, don't worry about circumcision because you're going to remain an ethne. You're going to remain a Gentile and you're not going to become a Jew. That's Paul. Paul's saying not to do that. So there's this dividing line and how you splice it up is just fascinating to me. With that being said, guys, give me your thoughts and i guess we could end this episode i'd like to do another one too just saying but yeah i don't know what do you think of that rabbi <laughs> this it, truth is that you you know as you're speaking i confess my mind is is just moving around you know when i when i walk around the streets of jerusalem i'm very fortunate and I, I really, what i said to you guys i hope you will come to jerusalem one day and and you watch me i walk every day and and if you tap me on the shoulder, people recognize me on the streets and and ask me, what are you thinking? So I'm really thinking of two things possible. There are two likely things I'm thinking about. One is I'm thinking about Tanakh and some very interesting text passage. But I've never said this to anyone. I'm gonna the other thing that goes through my mind a lot is what did this sound crazy to my fellow Jews. <laughs> so <laughs> what did, if we can dial back time, what would the letters of Paul have looked like in the first century? And that's a huge question. Like our first, um, like first Corinthians, I, I think it's P45. That's 150, 170 years after it was supposedly written. 
is a huge amount of time today in the ancient world 150 years was this a mile apart and i do wonder as dr price has mentioned what what did those letters look like in the first century it had to be very different whoever wrote the book of acts and this is what goes through rabbi singer's mind is whoever wrote the book of acts did he read letters of paul if he did he read something what did he read he clearly wasn't reading through what we have today this remains a mystery but you know for me the question is is, is not just academic for me it's to be able to help my people understand uh, of their own uh, spir spiritual um, legacy and to understand those who want to rob us of that treasure. So that's what goes to my mind. Mm. Dr. Price? Well, I, I think uh, it's equally important uh, to have interfaith dialogue, which is easy for, easy for me to say since I'm not exactly in any faith anymore, though I, I love all of them and I would like to further, if possible, mutual understanding. But I say that's equally important to not twisting the text advantageously, which is what I, uh, I'm objecting to in this uh, book I recently finished, Judaizing Jesus. Uh, I think you have to... Uh, not tailor the evidence because that's just a hollow victory if it's any kind of victory at all uh, and uh, you have to uh, take the bull by the horns and and come up with some way not to hate each other and actually i don't think that's very difficult though it's difficult to get people to do it. Uh, I mean, I, what should the problem be if everybody is saying uh, that uh, one of the top commandments is to love your neighbor as yourself? I mean, that's all you need, really. Uh, and uh, if, But uh, people are going to complicate that and mm -hmm. mess it up. But uh, I think it's more important that you believe in the atonement of the cross. Uh, is it really that... Uh... Well, if loving your neighbors kept you from hell, um, that would be, <laughs> for Christians, that would be great. Ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate you tuning in this far. Of course, Myth Vision Podcast is changing it up. We're bringing great stuff. I always enjoy both of these gentlemen. I hope to see you in the future in Israel. Um, Dr. Price, your health will get better. Then maybe we can talk about it. But we, I've already mentioned to Rabbi about potentially going and visiting at some point. We would mm. really like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really want the audience to go down in the description. Make sure you check out Rabbi's channel. If you're not familiar with it, go subscribe. He talks about very, very controversial topics within the New Testament and within the world of Judaism and in Israel and such. What's been going on from God TV and all these different things. You really should go check him out. Show him some support and love because he has been there for us as well and showed nothing but kindness and love. Um, you can go and Obviously, help Dr. Price out. Get some of the books. You could become a patron. Do you have a patron, Rabbi? I confess that I don't know what a patron is. <laughs> <laughs> it's a. It's, I, mean, I, I assume it. Just go to outreachjudaism.com or .org. Sorry, .org. Oh, oh you mean the, our website is outreachjudaism.org, of course. Yeah. Yeah, just go. <laughs> you can help Rabbi out in, in many ways. And of course, Myth Vision has a patron. I got the new gear now. I finally have a cartoon of myself. Um, it, it If you buy this, um, you actually, I can help send your, your loved one's souls out of purgatory. Hallelujah. Yeah, there's a, a, a angel grows its wings. All the good stuff. So um, you guys can get the merchandise if you want. I'm just throwing it out there because... Uh, we're closing out on this episode. I really can't tell you how much I appreciate this conversation. And how much I enjoyed it and how much I enjoyed Dr. Price and Derek, you not so much, but him, yeah. And <laughs> I don't blame you. I mean, you know. no, no, I'm kidding. I, I really appreciate the both of you very, very much and look forward to this ongoing, really interesting dialing up the text and going into it. It's fascinating. And and I feel very, very blessed by this. I really enjoy it. And I do, you should have uh, Dr. Price of Rafu Shalema, which means a complete recovery mm -hmm. and 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 Shalom Taivim and good years, Arichas Yom and long years. And you should come here to the Holy Land, really come here to Israel. I mean it from my heart. I very, very much look forward to splitting this falafel with you. Uh -huh. I didn't know, enjoying, enjoying the Holy Land with you. It's really a very special place. So, Shalom to both of you, and thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. And never forget, we are Myth Vision. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you like that show. Make sure you guys hit the like button on this. Subscribe to the channel and make sure you hit the bell. Join our Patreon. You'll get early access to all the videos I produce. And it really helps me, Derek Lambert, grow Myth Vision and continue doing this and bringing you these videos and all the effort put in. So I really do appreciate that, ladies and gentlemen. Don't forget to go down in the description. Go check out Rabbi Tovia Singer's uh, channel and check out Dr. Robert M. Price links. He has a YouTube channel and a Patreon. I really appreciate this, guys. We have more coming from these two.